is that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, your citizenship is not on this earth. Your citizenship is in heaven. And so, in essence, the world that we live in is not our home. And so Peter writes to encourage these believers who literally were living in physical exile, but then also spiritual exile because this world is not their home. And he writes to them to encourage them and to help equip them to live their lives on mission even while they're in exile. Peter wanted them to realize that they could have a huge impact on the culture if they live out the identity that they have in Christ, if they recognize that identity and embrace their mission. And so this letter, although it was written many, 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 many years ago, uh, is very applicable to you and I. It's something we can apply to our lives as well. Um, You and I may not be physically exiled. Maybe some have that experience. But most of us are not living outside of our home. We're we're American and this is our home, and so we don't have necessarily that uncomfortableness. However, as believers, we have, as I've said before, the, the church in general has kind of been pushed to the margins of culture, so in that sense, the church has kind of been exiled within the American culture. It used to have a lot more uh, respect and was a center of culture. So we, we experience it a little bit that way, but at, at the bottom line is, spiritually, we are exiles. This world is not our home. We're just living in a motel room. And, and the, the battle that we get into is that it gets so comfortable living in this hotel room. You know, we're just, we're comfortable. And it keeps us from living missionally. And Peter is trying to help his readers, and it applies to us, helping them to think like missionaries. And he begins by reminding them of their rich identity, and then he calls them to live that identity out in his culture. And so far, we have covered 1 Peter 1, verse 1, all the way through chapter 2, verse 17. Now, as I've gone through this, I've talked about a, a key passage within this entire letter. Anybody remember what that key passage was? It was in chapter 2. I want to just remind us of this, because I think this is really at the heart of what Peter is going for, what his purpose in this letter is for. He says, um, after talking about all this identity stuff and calling us to live it out, he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11-12, through 12, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of your flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, those who aren't believers, um, honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. Peter says, look, you're in exile um, you're not, it's, this isn't your home, you're not comfortable, but you know what? And you're even under some persecution, if we look in the context of the, of the passage. But he says, live good live, uh, lives, do good deeds, avoid sin, keep your conduct honorable, even in the midst of persecution and suffering. And when God reveals himself to non-believers, through the gospel, which is what he's referring to as the day of visitation, the day that God reveals himself to non-believers through the gospel, that they will believe in him and will bring glory to God. And then he shifts to giving some concrete examples as to what this kind of living looks like. What are some examples of good deeds, ways in which his readers can actually you know, position or posture themselves in culture, in order to live this out. And last week, we looked at the posture of being a good citizen. Living in submission to the authorities that have been placed in our lives, and we look specifically at government and how um, we're called to submit to authorities. If If what authorities are asking us to do is something we don't like, we don't care about, we think it's foolish, 
but it's not violating God's word or God's commands, our responsibility is to be good citizens and to submit to authority. And next, he's going to give another example, and that's where we will be today. He's going to give another example of how we can do good deeds. He's going to address uh, how slaves interact with their owners. And so I want to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 to 25, the words are on the screen. If, if you've got your own Bible, you can follow along. There, if you don't have a Bible and you'd like one, there's one in the seats around you there. Um, feel free to uh, get those out and utilize that. First Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 18 to 25. He says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, uh, and and you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an an example so that you might follow in His steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in His mouth. He was reviled, and yet He did not revile in return. When He suffered, He did not threaten, but He continued to entrust Himself to Him who judges justly. He bore... I'm sorry, He Himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Again, he's sharing with us an example as to how to be... uh, how to put God on display in the culture around us. And um, he is talking about slaves here, or servants. And and although that's the context, many uh, have thought that we can apply this to our current, in 2020, uh, as people who are employees or employers, to that relationship. Um, Now before we go too far, I think it's important that we back up a little bit and understand slavery in the Roman Empire uh, in order to see how there could be some comparison to employee-employer relationships. Um, Most of us, when we think of the word slavery, what jumps into our minds is the evil slave, I guess, culture that we found ourselves in 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 America. Uh, You know, think 1970s, the television miniseries Roots, if you remember that, um, by, Alex Haley, uh, yeah, by Alex Haley. Um, that's kind of what jumps into our mind when we think of slavery. It's this modern version of slavery. And it was horrible and it was wretched and it's, 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 it's a, really a, a black mark on the, the culture and history of America that we, that, that we were one day involved in that. Now, I want to be clear that any form of slavery is not good, it's it's not moral, it's not something that we want. But there were some differences between the modern slavery that we think of, of what we experience as a nation, and even see today around the world with um, human trafficking and things like that. The slavery in the first century in the Roman Empire had some differences. While there was some horrible things that took place, um, there were some differences. Now, one of the things that some people really criticize Scripture for, or the writers of the Scriptures, is that we don't see in Scripture a call to deconstruct slavery or to abolish slavery. And in some cases, we saw people justify and defend slavery by trying to use Scripture, and so they, uh, uh, they think, well, that's bad. The Scriptures didn't do that. But part of why that, I think, is that way is because 
the writers of the New Testament weren't as concerned about destructing this thing that was so prevalent and part of the culture. Rather, it was how do Christians live within this system? Okay? Um, and I, I think what stands in my mind, I think of Jesus. When Jesus was on the planet, we don't ever hear him talk about overthrowing Rome or, or you know, you know, being violent in that way. But he submitted to the Father, and he, he and we're going to look later at his example of the suffering that he did. Now that doesn't make slavery right; it makes it wrong. And I'm so glad that as a culture we've moved away from that. Uh, in no in no way uh, is it uh, a good thing. And those who have ever used the Bible to support slavery, I think, distort and misinterpret Scripture horribly. God does not approve of slavery. But the, but the writers, I think, were most concerned with how do you live in the midst of these difficult situations? Historians estimate that um, probably at the time, 16 to 20% of the entire population of 60 million in the Roman Empire were slaves. This would mean that there was probably around 12 million slaves. It was a driving force of the economy. Often slaves came from the spoils of wars. Um, and the Romans justified this because they felt like we could have killed you, but rather we brought you in and took you as slaves. That's probably how they justified it in their mind. Sometimes children were sold into slavery by their impoverished parents in order to pay off debts or to even provide a better future for their child. It's hard to believe but this is where we start seeing some of the differences between ancient slavery in the empire of Rome uh, versus what we think of, that the, the, the slave was not the very bottom of the socioeconomic structure. And so sometimes parents were so impoverished that they felt like their child could have a better future or they had debts to pay off. Sometimes creditors would force Judean fathers to sell their daughters. Some were born into slavery because their parents were slaves. Some sold themselves into slavery to pay off a debt or provide a better future for themselves. Now the word that's used here uh, in verse 18 when it says, slave, well it uses slaves in the NIV, servant in the ESV. This word that's used is not the commonly used word other places in Scripture, which is doulos. Um, that word just trans out, it translates just straight out to slave. But the word that's used here is, is not as common. Ikatis is the, is the Greek word, and it means household servant. And it really is probably focused on those servants who lived in the same house with their master. Probably their duties were restricted to the household. Some of the distinguishing features of slavery in the, in the Roman Empire were as follows. And, th and this is where, think about the slavery that we're aware of, that we understand, and think about these, and you'll see some of the differences and why maybe some people sold themselves into slavery or a parent would sell their child into slavery. Number one, Slavery in the Roman Empire was not based on skin or race or any of that. It had nothing to do with what people you were. It wasn't based on that. Slaves were often educated, and they could get educated while they were slaves. They were allowed to save money. They could actually save money to purchase their freedom. Some actually held high jobs and positions. There were slaves that were doctors, accountants, lawyers, tutors, Secretaries, nannies, nurses, and even held um, like city offices. Some had great influence, and most scholars would say that most slaves were free by the time they were the age 30. And so it, it, it was almost, it was more of an institution of slavery. Uh, just an example uh, for someone that actually it built up into their life and they got better after slavery, was Marcus Antonius Felix. He was the Roman governor of Judea in A.D. 52-58. to 58. 
Before he became the Roman governor, he was a slave of Antonia, the emperor Claudius' mother. And when she set him free, he was able to achieve huge success. We don't see that as often as when we think of slavery as we know it. Slaves were often treated as family. And it was actually possible for slaves to own their own things, but also to own slaves. Slaves could own slaves. Now, they had no rights, and some had masters that were very benevolent and kind, and others had masters that were horrible and abusive physically, sexually. Uh, there, so there was good and there was bad. A freed slave could actually, once he was freed, become a Roman citizen. And as I said earlier, believe it or not, slavery was not the bottom place in society. Some were so poor and impoverished that becoming a slave would actually give them a step up. We have a hard time getting our arms around that. And most free-born Romans didn't like the idea of working as long-time employees of somebody. And so this is another reason why the, the, the slave, the institution of slavery was very popular. Um, Romans didn't want to work for somebody. Now, so with all of this said, the, the institution of slavery in the Roman Empire in the first century was very different than what we're familiar with. Again, it doesn't make it right. Slavery is always wrong, but it's important to understand these differences as we look at these texts because I think this is partly why many commentators feel like there, there's, a, there's enough commonalities that we can compare this relationship to an employer and an employee relationship in regards to this passage, which, which brings it to you and I. Again, Peter and other New Testament writers were more concerned about how to live in the circumstances you find yourself in, whether fair or unfair. And with 12 million slaves in the empire, the odds were very high uh, that a large percentage of Peter's readers were slaves. And so, how do you posture yourself when you find yourself in the midst of slavery and possible mistreatment how do you posture yourself in that environment? And that's what Peter was concerned about, um, was, was that reality. As a matter of fact, you know, if you look at the writings of the Apostle Paul, he alludes, he uses the imagery of slavery and being a servant, being a bond servant. Some of the very words that he uses in Scripture come right out of the slavery terminologies, and he uses them to make, Christian um, points or uh, to help people understand what God has done for them. For example, the word redemption, the word justification, the word reconciliation were all terms taken right out of the institution of slavery. Paul often used the imagery of slavery to describe believers that we are now servants of God, that before Jesus we were in bondage or enslaved to Satan, this world and our flesh, but Jesus has set us free, and we are now servants of God. In the immediate context here, Peter says, submit to your masters. Respect them. And the kicker here is, Peter says, it doesn't matter how they treat you. Matter of fact, if you submit to them and show them respect, when they've been mis mistreating you and abusing you, that's, that's got a powerful missio, uh, missional statement in it. Now, again, remember, some masters were fair and they treated them well, but others were very harsh and very brutal. And when slaves would behave the way that Peter is calling them to live, it would sometimes open the eyes of their owners. It would make them think, why are you living this way? And often, slaves that became Christians right away became targets of the slave owner. So they knew, you're a Christian. 
And if, and if you reacted the way everybody else reacted, then it would be like, oh yeah, Christian, what, what does that mean? But when you start living the way Peter is calling them to lead, uh, uh, live, it looks different. It, it's, it opens eyes. It creates hunger. And Peter says, no matter your situation, submit and be respectful. Why? In verse 19, we see that enduring or bearing up under unjust or undeserved suffering is commendable when we do so while keeping our eyes on God. In other words, we deal with difficult, unfair, unjust circumstances by keeping our mind focused on God and honoring Him because of the missional opportunity that we have. It all comes back to God bringing Him glory and advancing His kingdom. And Peter says, if you suffer for, for, doing, you know, for doing something that you did wrong, well, that doesn't say anything. But when you suffer because you did good and you're still beaten by the Master, that's commendable to God. Suffering for doing good is commendable to God. And as he states this, he, he, he shifts very quickly to use Jesus as the example, as the inspiration for us, okay? For the slaves in that day that would be reading this letter, he, he, he calls them to be respectful, to live sub, in submission to their owners, even if they're being mistreated. And then he quickly shifts to the example of Christ. Christ is the role model, the example for how to suffer when you are innocent. Now, I want to stop there for a moment and shift this to modern day, to us. Okay, We're not living as slaves or servants in the same way, but we do have relationships with a supervisor or a boss, somebody that is over us. And... Um, it's important that we use these verses in that context and live it out. Wayne Grudem says, um, even though there is no exact parallel for such servant status in modern society, the fact that this was by far the most common kind of employee-employer relationship in the ancient world, and that it encompassed a broad range of degrees of functional and economic freedom, means that the application of Peter's directives to employees today is a very important one, or I'm sorry, very appropriate one. Peter is saying, submit to and honor the person who is your boss. Now, some people have great bosses. I mean, think of Paul and Marcy and the great boss that they have, that they serve under. Thanks, Tim, appreciate that. <laughs> But the reality is, you guys know what I'm talking about. Some of you have been through, maybe you're going through right now a time with a boss or a supervisor that's just killing you. I mean, it's tough. They're, they're mean. They're nasty. They target you. They call you out. They, they make life hard on you. They, they, maybe they want to get you fired. Maybe they want to see you leave. I don't know. But many of you have, at, at a minimum, gone through it in the past seen somebody else go through it, or maybe are going through it right now. And it's a tough situation. A boss that is overbearing, or harsh, or unkind, or unappreciative, demanding, verbally abusive. They play favorites and you're not it. Peter says, hang in there. Keep your mind focused on Christ. Bear up under the unjust behavior. Honor God by submitting and being respectful of your boss. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But this is why it has so much missional potential. Because it sounds ridiculous. Who does that? Who lives like that? Who reacts that way? We're all about our freedom and our rights. But when we endure unjust suffering, it becomes noticeable. 
in the midst of struggling with a difficult boss or supervisor, we should be asking important questions like, why did God put me here? Does He have a a plan or a purpose? Is He wanting to accomplish something in me or through me or both? Who is it in the midst of this that I can impact through honoring God and doing the right thing? See, when we focus our mind on that, we focus our mind on God, it gives us the ability to endure, to stand up under the unfair treatment. Because then it's not about us, but it's about bringing glory to God. But it's not easy. We have to die to self. And that's a challenge because we're pretty committed to self, aren't we? I know I am. But Peter offers a different way. He offers a countercultural way. He offers the Jesus way in this passage. He reminds his readers that it's to that very posture that Jesus took when he was on this earth that you and I are called to. Jesus suffered. And we are called to follow in His steps. He reminds his readers of the way Jesus suffered. And Peter knew this all too well. He was there. He witnessed it. He saw the unjust, unfair treatment that Jesus endured. Why did Jesus endure it? Because He was on a mission. He had a job to do. And He died to self. Let's go back to that section. We read it earlier, but I want to go back and reword that section beginning in verse 21 because there's so much there. It says, For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in His steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in His mouth. When He was reviled, He did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. What a powerful statement. Everything human about us screams against that posture. We have rights. But yet Jesus is the creator of the universe. He's God. He's all-powerful. And yet He surrendered to the will of the Father. He died to self. And He lived sacrificially, keeping the Father in focus. He didn't retaliate. He didn't lash out. And He is the example that we are to follow. This Greek word here used for the word example is a really vivid word. It's it's the word that that is used uh, to uh, explain how a child in ancient Rome would would learn to read. And it, it literally means example or outline or a writing copy. It's a word uh, that... It, it pictured this kind of an outline sketch that the learner, the child learning to read, would have to fill in, or it was actually a copy of clear, regular writing at the top of a page, and then the child was to copy that writing. Do you remember that? The big chief notebook, isn't that what they were called? We, we did that, right? This is the word in the Greek that's used to talk about Uh, the example that Jesus has left for us to follow. He has already laid the pattern out for us. Whatever we're facing, Jesus has already lived through it and showed us how to do it. He was innocent. All He did was good. And then He suffered for it. Jesus is the poster child of enduring unjust suffering. Often when you and I suffer, there's really... Nothing that we can do about it. It just kind of is there and we, have, we can respond in a positive way or a negative way. But Jesus had the power to change his circumstances. 
He could have stopped it, but he voluntarily laid down his rights. He willingly died to self and obeyed the Father. Did, do you remember the struggle in the garden before he was crucified? He's praying to the Father. He's, there, there's sweat beads of, of blood that are coming down. He, he's so, uh, this is not easy. Just because he's Jesus, we think, oh, he's Jesus. It, it wasn't easy. He was stressed, but yet he said, not my, my will, but your will, Father. And he went to the cross to die for the sins of humanity, making it possible for mankind to be reconciled to God. He paid the price that we deserve, that we should have paid. He didn't deserve to suffer. Think about his life. He loved people. He healed people. He, he was... He was good and kind. He didn't deserve to suffer. But yet, that's exactly what happened. Now I want to pause for a moment. Because when you come across a passage like this that lays out exactly what Jesus did, number one, it, 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 it is a, it's a great example for us as believers to follow, but it's also something we've got to stop and ask ourselves, what have you done with Jesus? We see the gospel here, a very clear picture of the gospel that Jesus Christ suffered and died for you and I. He died in our place. He didn't deserve it. We deserved it. But he died in our place. He made it possible for us to become Christians, to become uh, children of God, to know that eternity uh, is, is uh, going to be a place of paradise in heaven. He did that, not us. It's not about what we do, but it's about what Jesus did on the cross. We can't earn it. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He also said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from life to death. And so I ask briefly the question this morning, what have you done with Jesus? Have you put your faith and trust in Him? He is the only hope of salvation. But let's return to the conversation about submission to our boss. By following the example of Christ, the modern employee, you and I, if we follow Christ's example, we can be an example of Christ to our supervisors to the people that we work with, the people around us. And as, Pat, as Peter wraps this section up, he reminds his readers that they have a God that is the good shepherd. That Jesus is always there caring for us, guiding us. We really have nothing to fear. He's always on watch. He's always with us. Jesus is guiding us along the way. We find peace in realizing these truths about Jesus. In the midst of whatever we face, we have a good shepherd that's with us, protecting us, ensuring our hope of eternity. He protects our inheritance. Remember at the very beginning of the letter, that was one of the things that Peter reminds his readers of, is that they have an inheritance, they have a hope. That inheritance is guarded by God. He reminds his readers of this truth. We have an inheritance and a hope that can never perish, never spoil, never fade, and that's kept in heaven for us. Our good shepherd keeps this and ensures it for us, and we can rest in that promise. We live life here with eternity in mind. That's how we bear up underneath these difficult circumstances is because as we suffer, we know this isn't it. This is just a world we're passing through. Our real citizenship is in heaven. Our identity is in Christ. When we live a life like this, it will create interest and curiosity in the people around us to say why. 
Why do you live like that? Why don't you retaliate? Why do you so respectfully submit? And it can open doors to sharing our faith. Creates opportunities. It's part of the missional strategy that Peter is giving us in this letter. Remember that key verse. Do such good deeds that people will come to Christ. <laughs> They'll see the way you live. They'll ask questions. Between A.D. 800 and 1200, the Vikings became a force to reckon with. They were not a civilized group of people. They had no Christian background. They would burn and pillage villages, towns, they were especially focused on churches and monasteries. Uh, they killed and raped as they went. They would sell monks into slavery. They would even, they were so brutal, if there was other Viking groups that they didn't like or you know, had bad blood between, they would take their daughters and sell them into slavery. They were ruthless and brutal. A contemporary of that time writes this about what they were living through. He said, the Northmen cease not to slay and carry into captivity the Christian people, to destroy the churches and to burn the towns. Everywhere there is nothing but dead bodies, clergy and laymen, nobles and common people, women and children. There is no road or place where the ground is not covered with corpses. We live in distress and anguish before this spectacle of the destruction of the Christian people. However, the conquerors, the Vikings, became conquered by the faith of their captive. It was usually monks or young Christian girls that were taken. And these young Christian girls were forced to live as wives or mistresses to Viking men. And history tells us that those captives, eventually, by living their faith, won those Viking men to Christ. And scholars say that the Viking culture was transformed in literally one generation. In an article titled The Kingdom Strikes Back by missiologist Ralph Winter, um, he writes of this era. He says, in God's, provision, in God's providence, he worked redemption in the midst of the harrowing tragedy of this new invasion of barbarian violence and evil that fell upon God's beloved people. After all, he spared not his own son in order to redeem us. Thus again, what Satan intended for evil, God used for good. So we see that the way in which enslaved girls and, and monks lived their lives, amongst the Viking, this brutal, horrible, uh, violent culture, they began to win the people over that held them captive. And they, they changed the, Vi the Viking culture in a generation. It's incredible. That's what Peter's calling us to. To live such good lives that the people that are opposed to Christ, the people that are opposed to us would be drawn to this God. Next week we'll look at more of those good deeds. We'll begin to look uh, in the family and how Peter instructs families to live in order to be countercultural, in order to create questions, in order to do good deeds. So let's just close in prayer this morning. God, we we thank you that you um, walk with us in the midst of difficult trial and suffering. God, we, we don't have, in America, I look at the things that we suffer with, and it's so much less. It could get worse. It may. Are we ready? Are we prepared? But God, in, in our context right now where we are, the worst we may face is a, a boss that we don't like or a, a supervisor that makes life hard on us. God, give us the strength and the grace and the ability through your spirit to live the way Peter's calling us to live, to honor and respect 
those that are supervising us so that it brings glory to you. So that it, it makes you look amazing to other people. Like God is, uh, this guy, this God transforms people. God, but we can't do it in our own strength. We need you. And so I pray that the Holy Spirit would fill us and strengthen us to be able to live the way you've called us to live. So thank you for your word, God. Thank you for being able to spend some time in it today. In Jesus' name, amen.